えー、皆さんこんばんは、えー、それでは時間になりましたので第73回の東京大学医学教育セミナーを開催したいと思います、えー、本日ですけれども、えー、オープンエデュケーションアンドイッツインプリケーションズフォーメディカルエデュケーションということで、えー、こちらの客員教授でやられますメリディ先生とそれから今日は特別ゲストということでえー、東大の方でこのオープンエデュケーションを展開しておられる宮川先生にですね、えー、ご登壇いただくというふうなスペシャルな企画になっております、えー、このオープンエデュケーションという考え方ですけれども、えー、例えばその最近ですね、えー、逆転授業というふうなことが割とあのいろんなメディアでですね、えー、出てきたりするんですけれどもえーまあ、家でそのコンピューター上で、えー、いろんな情報を、まあ、学んでですねそれを今度授業に持ってきて授業ではあの別に事実を学ぶというふうなことでなくて、えー、その家で学んでいたことを生かしてですねディスカッションするとそういうふうな方がよりその理解を深めてでいい学びになるんではないかとそういうふうなご提案がなされたりしています。でそういったことにですね使うためのこうリソースとして、まあ、最近「MOOC」というふうな言葉も割とこう知られるようになってきていますが、まあ、そういった考え方をですね、えーまあ、MIT の方でその宮川先生が随分展開されてきたということで、まあ、本日はかなり、えーまあ、新しいですねいろんな考え方を知ることができるんじゃないかなというふうに期待しております。えー、まあ,あ一応7時半までの予定で考えておりますが、まあ、30分ずつぐらい、えー、お二人の先生方にお話しいただいて、えーまあ、その後で質疑応答というような形にできればというふうに考えておりますそれでは宮川先生ありがメイリーさんとはもう長年の,あの知り合いなんですけど、メイリーさんと一緒に、えー、講演させていた,いただきますので、あのメイリーさんももちろん英語で話しますので、私もあの一応英語で話すということになっておりますので、よろしくお願いします。I'm going to talk the first 30 minutes and then Mary will talk、uh, the following 30 minutes. I'm going to be talking about、uh, general、uh, points about open education. And, I, and Mary will then talk about the implications for medical education.、Um, the start of open education, many, many、uh, places, but one. A、um, clear start is what we did at MIT in 2001,、uh, what we call Open Courseware.、Uh, open Courseware is an institute wide project where、uh, MIT has made available on the web for free and openly teaching materials from virtually all of the courses that we teach. And we teach about、uh, 2,300 courses.、Uh, it was announced in、uh, 2001 by then President Charles Best. Next day became front page article. So, this is the beginning of 
open education. And open course fair uh, continues, as I will show you. Ten years later, in 2011, something else happened. Two professors at Stanford announced that they are making available their introduction to artificial intelligence, which they have been teaching for many years. Online, open, anyone could register. And something like 160,000 people from 190 countries registered for the course. 160,000 people. Um, and students turned in homework every week. The homework was uh, graded by machine. Uh, and uh, those who finished at the end got a uh, certificate from the two professors. That was big news, and it made the front page of New York Times again. And so these are the two big trends today in uh, open education, open courseware and uh, MOOCs. And they uh, reside side by side. So let me take you through a little bit of MIT's open courseware. And then I'll take a, uh, talk a little bit about uh, uh, some uh, things we see with MOOCs. And so uh, you can. So this is from MIT OpenCourseWare. This is uh, ocw.mit.edu. Uh, you don't have to register, you go right in. And uh, you will see courses according to departments. So this is uh, uh, aeronautics and astronautics. And um, let's look at the very first course. This is Introduction to Aerospace Engineering. And you can see on the left, syllabus, calendar, readings, assignments, projects. projects. Many courses have uh, projects. MIT is very much project-based education. Uh, and students uh, create these projects. This is an uh, aeronautics course. And so students have to uh, create something that flies. Uh, and so this is lighter than air competition. They do this at the end. Uh, and the objective uh, of this uh, project is that it has to fly stable. It's got to be controllable. It has to be able to carry a payload. It has to be fast. And this is very important. The flying has to be aesthetically pleasing. It cannot just be fast. It cannot just carry lots of payload, it has to look beautiful when it flies. Okay, if you want an A from this course. Uh, the professor created a uh, big uh, course uh, around which the students raced their, um, uh, their flying objects, and they were rated by how much uh, it was able to carry, uh, how reliable it was, how stable, and how beautiful it was, how aesthetically pleasing it was. Um, right. So uh, if, you, if you look at these courses, one of the, the fun parts for me is to look at the, uh, the student projects. So we go down another part of uh, campus. This is uh, computer science, which is the largest um, department at MIT. And uh, you can see that uh, the computer science faculty members have put up pretty much all of their courses, um, undergraduate and graduate courses on open courseware. Oh, goodness. It's gotten even more since I went last time. Uh, so uh, all of this is available. So let's take a look at that one of them. Uh, this is uh, Circuits by uh, Professor Agarwal. And again, you see syllabus, calendar, lecture notes, Let's get lecture notes. So uh, the faculty member, Professor Agarwal, has made available uh, on his OCW site all of the, uh, the lecture notes from his class. 
and uh, his lecture was actually quite fun to, uh, to look at, even though I'm not a computer scientist. And by going through the uh, lecture notes, you can pretty much understand uh, what he's doing in class. Okay, and you can see that he has lecture notes for all of his classes. You can download these, you can use it for yourself. That's part, that's the whole point of open courseware. You can also see that uh, he has assignments. These are real assignments that he assigned in class. Uh, so this was assigned uh, on, uh, in 2007. And uh, it's real homework that he has made available. Some faculty members uh, even put up answers to the, uh, the assignments as well. He has also made available exams that he's given. These are real exams, um, quizzes. Okay. You can see it's a real, real quiz because you have to put your name here. Um, and uh, all of these problems in the quiz. Uh, people who access open course often take these exams to check for themselves their understanding of uh, uh, the course. So that's computer science. Let me show you just one more. Uh, this is actually my course uh, that I teach with John Dower, some um, quite eminent historian. This is called visualizing cultures. And what we do is to look at history by looking at visuals. So this is Commodore Matthew Perry's arrival in Japan. And we collected literally hundreds of images from uh, collections all over the world uh, about Perry. We have 52 units of various topics in Asian history. Not just Japan, but also China and the Philippines as well. One important point about this uh, that uh, you can see is that we have agreements with about 200 different museums. To do this, we need images. Open Courseware has a uh, policy that anything that we put on Open Courseware is available under what's called Creative Commons license. Creative Commons license. Under Creative Commons, uh, you can download freely, you can copy, uh, you can distribute, you can alter, you can change things. Um, as long as it's for nonprofit. And I went around to these museums asking for their images under Creative Commons. And so we, we have agreements with uh, uh, all of those museums with that agreement. It's important that we have that agreement because uh, open courseware is made available to people all over the world so that you can use whatever material that we provide without worrying about it, without worrying about copyright. And so we clear the copyright for you. You can download it, you can alter it, you can Put it into your own uh, material. Whatever you want to use, you're free to use. Um, all of it, the uh, lecture notes that you saw uh, from computer science course, same thing. You can download, you can alter, you can distribute. As long as you get an attribution that you got this from MIT Open Course. Okay. Uh, I chaired the MIT Open Courseware Faculty Advisory Committee for a number of years. And I was often asked, why do you do this? Why does MIT give away for free uh, without any condition, essentially, this uh, treasure trove of intellectual property that we have? And the response I gave often was actually not my own, but uh, something that then President Charles Vest uh, 
mentioned, and that is that if you share money, it disappears, but if you share knowledge, it increases. That um, captures the real spirit of open education. Why do we do this? Why do we share? We share because we feel that by doing so, we will we increase our own knowledge, as well as to benefit the rest of the world. Uh, more recently, the president of MIT today, uh, Raphael Reif, says something very similar. I don't think we should erect barriers around knowledge created at universities. It should be wide open, very much uh, in, uh, in spirit of open education. So, why does MIT you know, do this open education? Why did we start it? Well, if you look at MIT's mission, not open courseware mission, but if you look at MIT mission, the idea of openness is in that mission itself. So this is from our MIT's uh, website. The Institute of MIT is committed to generating, disseminating, and preserving knowledge and to working with others to bring this knowledge to bear on the world's great challenges. Up until Open Call Square, MIT fulfilled this mission essentially through basic research. That's what MIT is known for, basic research. But with Open Call Square and more recently MOOCs, uh, MIT is able to fulfill this mission also in education uh, by disseminating uh, all the teaching materials that uh, we have at MIT. Um, large number of faculty members participate in open courseware. 66% of tenure track faculty, that's regular faculty, uh, have contributed to open courseware. Uh, as of today, 2,242 courses uh, have been published. 77 of them have full videos. Uh, and we have neuroscience, I'll talk about that. Uh, 1,018 translated courses. We have translation partners, uh, Spanish, Portuguese, Chinese, uh, Persian, uh, Turkish, and I think a couple others that have translated MIT open course courses into their languages. Um, if you look at access, 45.6% um, from North America, um, and then 17.7% uh, from Russia and Asia, 17% uh, from East Asia, including Japan, 9.3% um, from India. India is also a very active participant in uh, open education. 4.6% um, in South America. South America is starting to really come up in, uh, in the world of open education. 4.1% uh, in the northern part of Africa where internet is accessible. 1.7% in Sub-Saharan Africa because the internet just isn't there. When we saw that number, 1.7% for Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, we decided we got to do something about that. Uh, and when we looked at national universities in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, University of Zambia, what we learned was that although the internet uh, is not there yet in the way that you find in Japan and uh, in many other industrialized countries, national universities have very good internet, um, ODA uh, supported uh, internet. And so we created these mirror sites where we download the entire open courseware content onto hard drives and literally carry them to uh, Africa and other parts. The, uh, the red stars are the mirror sites. Okay. So that's um, the synopsis of the Microsoft open courseware. Um, right now, we, we get uh, 1.4 million people, not yet, million people accessing open courseware every month. 1.4 million people. So that's one of the largest educational sites in the world. Okay, let me um, 
move to uh, MOOCs. Um, MOOCs, or Massive Open Online Course, is like open courseware, part of open education, because it's offered, uh, for the most part, free. And anyone can sign up. <coughs> As I said, <coughs> the two Stanford professors offered the uh, uh, artificial intelligence course. 160,000 people registered. Um, unlike open course, open courseware offers materials, as you saw, teaching materials, lecture notes, quizzes. Um, MOOCs are a complete course. This is uh, one example. Uh, it's based on uh, visualizing cultures that I showed you. It's a complete course which we taught uh, last uh, September. This was a MOOC produced jointly by MIT and Harvard. And it's a very unusual uh, collaboration in that way. Uh, we collaborated at uh, MIT and Harvard. The first uh, faculty member you saw, John Dower, uh, some of you may know John Dower. He's very famous for having written Embracing Defeat, uh, which won the Pulitzer Prize in 1999. The second professor, Andrew Gordon, is a very eminent historian of modern Japan at Harvard. The third person, Jennifer Weisenfeld, is a, a very, very well-known art historian of uh, modern Japan teaching at Duke University. Uh, and so we, we created this and we offered it through edX. edX is a nonprofit organization originally created by Harvard and MIT, each invested $30 million in uh, 2011 and created this organization through which we offer MOOCs. There are now many, many, many members of edX, including the University of Tokyo. I'll talk about that uh, at the end. Um, MOOCs are a complete course. And so uh, you have video lectures, Uh, we were able to use this amazing facility at Harvard, the Hauser facility for uh, video um, filming. Uh, that's uh, it's almost like a little Hollywood that, that they created in the basement of the Widener Museum. Um, along with the videos, you get quizzes right after each video, and each video is from two to seven minutes long. This is something that uh, we have learned that in online education, in online education, if you want your learner to pay close attention 
from beginning to end uh, of your video, it cannot be very long. Two to seven minutes is ideal. Uh, and we had probably about 40 of those two to four minute videos. And after each video, you get uh, quizzes that are graded. We also created um, other exercises, timeline, you uh, drag and drop images into the right timeline. Um, visual analysis of uh, uh, different uh, images that we have. All which are machine gradable. That's important. You have so many people taking uh, these courses. We had uh, 9,000 registered. But on the first day, uh, 3,800 actually started the MOOC, and 1,150 finished the MOOC. 1,150, that's in, in one semester. That's more than uh, all of the students that I have taught at MIT over 23 years, just in one semester. Um, where did they come from? 34% um, from the United States, 10% from Japan, and then 3% from lots of different countries. Um, we had Germany, China, Spain, Brazil, Canada, India. Uh, we had people from Afghanistan, and so forth. Along with uh, the video lectures, the quizzes, there are discussion forums. And are very active. So for example, we put up this image right at the beginning. This is a Shiseido image. Before we did anything with Shiseido, and we asked the, uh, the learners to comment on this uh, image. We, 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 we had some questions. And um, 804 people put up comments. 804 people. And these were not just in the little comments. Some of them are quite lengthy comments. And it's just that really surprised me. And so learners are very active. They're anxious. And they're anxious to not only learn from the video lectures and so on, but also to interact uh, with other learners. Um, One of the uh, things about MOOC is that anyone can sign up. Anyone can sign up. And so uh, you, you have a big number uh, at the beginning, and then it drops off. The uh, average completion rate for a MOOC is between 5 and 7%. It's a small number. But when you, uh, you know, when you realize that the beginning number is a large number, 9,000, or 10,000, that's still quite a large number. One of my students did a, uh, um, a bit of research on which learners uh, are likely to stay until the end. He looked at uh, the, this MOOC in the second day, the ninth day, and the 20th day. We had a big discussion um, activities. And what he found was that, so uh, the biggest circle is uh, the registered number of uh, um, students. And then the green <coughs> is the first, the second day, the second day, okay? What he found was that the average number of discussion um, contributions was 2.68. So they weren't contributing that much. By uh, the middle of the course, uh, students are contributing 7.73. By the end of the course, those who remain were contributing 10 discussion uh, uh, postings. And so more that people discuss, the more likely that they will remain uh, with the course. Uh, the final point I'd like to tell you, in my part of the time is uh, coming to an end, is MOOCs are designed to be offered to the outside world. But what I found, and what many of my colleagues are finding, is that use of this kind of material 
transforms the classroom education. And so, along with offering this MOOC last fall, I taught an MIT course called Visualizing Japan. Exactly at the same time. Exactly at the same time. Um, and, um, and so, I assign the students the video lectures before they come. And I actually didn't know what was going to happen, but um, something quite surprising happened. I assigned the video lectures. Students came in, and uh, uh, I just happened to ask a question. Uh, I, I, I asked, uh, you know, what happened in 1868? And usually before, students who were given reading assignment, maybe two of them would know the start of the major restoration. <clears throat> Everyone knew. And so I, uh, that surprised me. And so I decided to not show my PowerPoint lecture, but I kept asking questions. Why did that happen? And what were the consequences? And basically for an hour and 30 minutes, I did not lecture. I kept asking and, and interacting with students, and students were interacting with each other. I've never had, never had a lecture like that before. And, and, and that, uh, we were able to continue with that for basically the entire semester. Students said that they learned so much more by learning this way. Why? First, they get the information from the video lectures. Uh, they come to class, and they're reinforced on that knowledge from, uh, from uh, the questions and from talking about it with each other. Um, one of the uh, students is something very interesting. Uh, and so most of the class was what's called this flipped class. Uh, I had some straightforward lecture classes because I had to introduce new material. And what this student uh, found, she actually timed uh, the number, the time when I, I spoke and the time when students spoke. And what she found was that during a le regular lecture class, I spoke 80% of the time, the students spoke 20% of the time. That's still not bad. Okay? But for flip class, it was 50 to 50. And because students were able to participate so actively, it was not just that they were speaking more, it was qualitatively different. And there was much more learning that was going on in the, uh, the flip class. Okay? So what I can tell you is that I can never go back to a lecture class after this experience. OK, my time is up, so thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Niagawa, for a great introduction. And uh, I love how you ended with your experience with uh, flipping your classroom, uh, because it's very much the experience that our faculty have experienced um, in medical education, uh, using uh, a lot of video material in preparation for discussion time. Uh, and. Um, in some of my previous talks, I've talked about how um, in our reformed curriculum, there were no required lectures. Actually, the preparation prior to coming to meeting face-to-face -face has been a combination of video lecture uh, materials versus reading, etc. But the focus is on the face-to-face -face discussion, which 
qualitatively has really transformed the way students learn. So what I'm going to talk about is um, the implications of uh, these approaches to medical education. And uh, for medical education, we actually have uh, three areas. Uh, we have uh, teaching and learning for the undergraduates, the medical students, um, clinical care when they become residents, um, and uh, many of our institutions have a great focus on research as well. But throughout all of these areas, uh, we have what we call a continuum of training. Uh, and um, we need to think about how we can use these different tools uh, effectively in all three areas. And I know that there is quite a difference among institutions uh, regarding how much technology they've already been incorporating into their programs, um, but technology is here to stay. Um, you know, just uh, go around, look, uh, when I ride the subways here, everybody is on a smartphone. Um, and actually visiting temples and gardens, people aren't looking at these beautiful gardens, they're looking at their smartphones. Um, it, it, technology is completely pervasive, uh, but what it does is it does increase access to more diverse and flexible learning experiences, and students are expecting that in their education today. So it's not if you are going to use these tools, but how are you going to use these tools? How well will you use them in your curricula? And most importantly, why are you using these tools? Um, you're not using the tools for the tool's sake, but they really must serve a purpose um, in education. I just want to briefly um, talk about uh, back in 2010, uh, Haiti experienced a terrible earthquake, uh, and at the time um, there were major issues with relief efforts, uh, and one of our students, Patrick Meyer of the Fletcher School at Tufts, um, was studying about uh, something called Ushahidi, which is crowdsourcing, an open crowdsourcing tool. And he decided to use this tool that began in Kenya around tracking voting rights, to use this tool um, to be able to allow ordinary citizens in the, in the earthquake um, disaster area to send signals um, and messages about who needed help where. And this was so effective in terms of helping um, the different agencies actually locate where help was needed and to direct um, major relief efforts more quickly. Uh, and it was so successful, actually, that it now has become um, standard in disasters uh, and actually was used quite extensively here in Japan during the 2011 um, uh, earthquake. And so I insert this here uh, really to emphasize the importance of open systems. The Ushahidi that was created in Kenya was an open system that a student happened to think, gosh, you know, maybe we could use this for disaster relief. He was able to mobilize other students and people in the community to create the system extremely quickly that aided um, the earthquake in, her, in, in Haiti and now has become a global standard. I, I want to um, also just have a few quick definitions um, uh, put up here uh, for you to think about. Uh, we talked about face-to-face -face, uh, education where you're in the classroom directly uh, speaking with your students. Online learning um, uh, is broadly used for any, anything where students are accessing materials online. Um, it's often used um, uh, for talking about MOOCs where every, the entire course is online. Um, what you may see more often is what's called blended learning, 
on, this is something we do at Tufts, where the students experience both online learning as well as face-to-face. -face. Um, you also may see the term hybrid learning, um, where uh, students actually meet face-to-face -face for part of the course, but the rest of it is online. Um, and uh, there's a wide, wide spectrum, um, but I just wanted to make sure that uh, you are somewhat familiar with those terms. Uh, and I want to talk about where MOOCs fit into the larger landscape of open um, programs, open software, open content. Um, it can be a very confusing field. This is greatly oversimplified, but you know I think that um, it could be helpful for those of you who are not familiar with this area. So number one is behind all of this, there has to be some technical foundation. Um, we all use the internet, we use Google. Um, these are uh, basically cloud services. You know you don't see what's behind the curtain. you just you know, use your, your Google um, uh, on your computer to, to look things up. You don't know what's happening behind the scenes. Um, there's a lot of software that we use, um, you know, the Gmail and, and uh, you know, Adobe Flash and all of these software systems that we just take for granted. We don't really think about where they come from. Many of those are open. There's also a lot of open content. So for medicine, um, there are thousands of open resources that are available. Um, and um, there were, um, there's open content that's been around since the 1980s. We actually, Tufts has been engaged in developing open content since the um, mid-1980s when the National Library of Medicine was encouraging universities to start creating open digital libraries and open content to try to share medical knowledge um, worldwide. And so there are digital libraries, e-journals, um, uh, now there are over 10,000 open e-journals, um, MOOCs, uh, uh, as Dr. Mia Gawa discussed, you know, it has, um, they have been also increasing many, many different resources um, and data sets like the Human Genome Project. All of these things can be used for you to create different instruction modules. Uh, and if you look at the MOOC components, um, Dr. Miyagawa talked about the content um, creation. The, the examples that he gave were all completely open where not only, you know, at MIT, not only is the course open, but you're able to use the components of the course in your own course. There are MOOCs where even though the course itself is open, the material cannot be pulled off the net. And so I just wanted to um, make you aware that there is a spectrum of open content. MIT's is completely open, but there are those um, posted where there is closed content. The other thing, um, there's a trend now for MOOCs where schools are trying to figure out, um, is there a way of supporting these efforts? Um, up until now, um, many of these efforts have been funded by foundations, grants, um, the institutions themselves, but Many institutions are saying, well, we cannot afford to sustain these. So they're looking for ways of funding um, these efforts. And so one way is um, you can take the course for free, uh, but if you want credit, whether uh, you want credit for employment or working towards a degree, then you pay um, some nominal fee um, for that credit. Uh, the other thing is that uh, there are varying amounts of faculty access. You know, when you have a course of 10,000 students, it's pretty difficult to have faculty-student interaction. Um, but there are models of MOOCs um, that are evolving where um, the faculty who create the course 
um, create uh, teaching um, uh, modules that are then carried out by whether it's volunteer faculty or a cadre of trained faculty that can then interact with clusters of students. And so that's another, another model that is evolving where um, you can actually have faculty access even with a, even with a very large MOOC. I want to mention, um, you know, Tufts, uh, along with many other schools, has joined uh, MIT and Harvard in the edX. Um, we have faculty who participated in a recent MOOC, The Biology of Water and Health, um, this past fall, uh, part one, it's actually um, the first part of a three-part series. And um, what's interesting is we think it's because of the topic. Um, a smaller number of enrollees, only 4,000 um, enrolled, um, many from um, uh, resource poor areas, Africa, Southeast Asia, and it's not surprising they, the people there would be interested in the biology and water and health. But a very high completion rate, 38%, where the average has been more in the 5 to 10% range. And again, we think it's because of the topic that, the, that these people who took this course self-selected. And the same thing with our open courseware. Um, Tufts open courseware is mainly health sciences based. And we find that the majority of the users of our courses actually all have higher degrees. They're all masters and up. Um, and so we think it's just a different group of people who are, who are taking our courses. Um, in using MOOCs, um, you can think of when you're creating a, um, your course, think about where the content is coming from. So if you're, think about the course that you're teaching now. Is there a way of using a MOOC as part of your course, as Dr. Miyagawa said, you know, um, assigning um, the MOOC as pre-work before they come face to face with you, combining that with other multimedia resources and textbooks or journals or whatever, and then having them come and discuss the material with you face to face or potentially use online laboratories or simulations um, and then find different ways of assessing um, the students. And when we think about un the undergraduate curriculum, um, we think about core content and things like pathology and physical diagnosis, there are many materials online um, that many universities have been willing to share. Um, and those of you who, um, I know there are some folks here who know that I've been um, teaching a course, um, uh, well, teaching some um, uh, seminars on radiology where I'm showing how to read chest x-rays and also combining that with a review of anatomy. I'm using materials that are all open um, online, so students are able to go back to that material anytime they want. And so when you think about um, the things that are available, uh, for instance, uh, New York University created a virtual microscope. So it's software that any university can use to create a virtual microscope in their own system. Uh, and University of Utah actually um, has shared an enormous library of pathology images which we use at Tufts. Um, and here are some other um, uh, resources. These are resources that I used um, for the, the x-ray and anatomy seminar that I've been running. So when you think about creating content, you can think about um, uh, at Tufts, we use the Tusk platform, which I've mentioned previously, also is open source software. We've made it freely available to anybody in the world. We use the New York University's virtual microscope. We combine it with the free pathology slides that Utah has made available, and we've repurposed it and created our own histology course within Tufts. Um, 
then what happens is that material gets combined with a lot of licensed materials that we have. So for instance, um, the university licenses full e-textbooks, e-journals. Our students do not buy any books. Everything is online. But because those books are licensed, they then are part of a finished course which has a mix of open content and a mix of licensed content. And you know, people ask me, well, why can't Tufts make all of its materials available online? We had combined all the materials so that it's seamless for our students, but that means it's a little messier to, to make it fully available to anyone um, online because it's not all completely open material. For clinical care, many of the resources for training residents are the same um, as for training students. Um, you know, the x-ray imaging that I, I showed, actually that can be used very effectively for training interns and residents as well as students. Um, but I want to touch upon resources for patient care. Uh, and one um, resource um, that we created at Tufts about 10 years ago um, this again was from the National Library of Medicine. Um, we partnered with a local community health center, um, our medical school and hospital in Boston is right in the middle of Chinatown. And so we serve the um, greater Boston Asian community. And so um, we created a project where we wanted to create patient education resources in the native languages of all of the people that were served by the community health center. And so um, we started creating uh, resource materials in Khmer, Chinese, Hmong, Korean, Laotian, Thai, Vietnamese, and um, we've also um, included uh, Japanese. And so um, I wanted to highlight this. Um, so any of you who are engaged in primary care, and if you have patient information in both English and Japanese, we would love to add that to the resource. And I also just want to make you aware that this is an open resource. So if you're taking care of patients who need either the Japanese or the English patient education materials, please um, feel free, um, look at this resource and see if there's something useful to you. Um, it's being used now in over 170 countries. Uh, so, um, and we've, we've had wonderful contributions from around the world. Uh, the, the content comes from either government agencies, universities, or um, healthcare agencies. So for research, um, I think that uh, you know there are a growing. Uh, there's there's really a very rapidly growing um, uh, cluster of resources. Um, I mentioned the Human Genome Project, uh, but also uh, many of you probably are familiar with the Visible Human Project. Um, again, another National Library of Medicine project uh, back in 1989. Um, where they uh, created a massive library of um, images of, of both a male and female human cadaver. And the data uh, that was originally created uh, then spawned many different projects um, through many different universities where they created enhanced three-dimensional images um, and then um, other universities collaborated and created tools um, to use the 3D images. Uh, there were then uh, numerous international um, meetings uh, to share that information. And there are just dozens and dozens of publications of the work of all of these um, researchers from around the world that have been uh, using the data from the Visible Human Project. And the implications from this um, are really important because I don't know about here in Japan, but in the US, we are losing anatomists. 
Um, there is an entire generation where we do not have anatomists. And so there are many medical schools that actually no longer have actual dissection in their training. It's all virtual dissection. And um, it's because there are no anatomy faculty. And so the, the wealth of information here uh, is, is absolutely critical, I think, in, in training future physicians. And the simulations that are being created are, are um, much more improved and, and uh, you know, I think is going to lead to um, courses, probably MOOC-type courses, that many medical schools will use in teaching anatomy. The other thing I wanted to mention is um, another project that um, we engaged in with the uh, USAID um, called the RESPOND initiative um, around pandemic training. Um, I was part of this part of the program where we worked with uh, 10 different universities across Southeast Asia uh, around faculty development, um, working across medicine, public health, veterinary medicine, um, uh, and uh, what was critical about this is that when you think about pandemic training, um, it's not if a pandemic will happen, it's when will the next pandemic happen. And what's critical here is that in doing the faculty development across all these schools and countries, um, and mind there are four different languages here, um, it was really critical for us to talk about open course development from the very beginning. So that when we trained these folks from all these different disciplines and different countries and different schools, they're all starting to share the same platform. They're creating, they're co-creating training programs and sharing them across these disciplines and countries. And that's going to be absolutely critical when a pandemic happens so that they can coordinate their efforts. Um, and the work that was done here in Southeast Asia has now been carried over into Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and um, across Eastern and Central Africa. We worked with another um, eight countries um, across Africa using uh, the same materials um, that we did here in Southeast Asia. We also used Tusk, the um, infrastructure that I mentioned, so that they had some place to put their content into um, and to make it much easier to share content across all these different institutions. I wanted to mention that the NIH, National Institutes of Health, um, has created this website for global health researchers. There are extensive materials from resources to courses for training faculty around the world in global health. Um, and, and these kinds of resources are, are, are just continuing to grow. So the benefits um, I see uh, really are this open education, open resources, enhanced teaching and research. I can give you many, many examples of um, uh, how our faculty have really seen the benefits. Um, they each reach more people. You know, Dr. Miyagawa, you mentioned, you know, the, the thousands of students that you reached in, in one semester versus face-to-face um, -face, um, in the semester. So the visibility and impact are, are really huge. For the institution itself, the institution itself increases its reach. Um, it enhance, it, uh, the faculty really enhance the curriculum, the research and reputation of the institution, and um, also fulfills the mission of public good in terms of sharing the content being created uh, across the university. And for students, what they find is that um, their education is more flexible, much more engaging, uh, and more effective. And given the volume and complexity of material that students need to learn in medicine, um, that's uh, really critical. So I'll end here. Uh, I write a 
7 o'clock so we can start jumping into questions. Thank you.